Bravo. Bravo. Good evening, everyone. I'm Maggie Williams, director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Tonight, David Gergen, director of Harvard University's Center for Public Leadership and, and senior political analyst for CNN, will interview Barbara Walters for change. <laughs> David Gergen has advised four U.S. presidents, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Clinton. Barbara Walters has interviewed Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, <laughs> Bush Sr., Clinton, Bush Jr., and Obama. So I imagine these two will have a lot to talk about tonight. As much or perhaps more than that of any journalist, Barbara Walters' career embodies and has shaped the history of television journalism and its impact on American politics. In 1977, she conducted a groundbreaking, in-depth interview of Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. For decades to follow, her signature interviews of heads of states, presidential candidates, and cultural entertainment icons informed and fascinated our country and the world. Just a range of people interviewed by Barbara Walters is amazing. To name a few off the top, the Shah of Iran, Margaret Thatcher, Putin, Fidel Castro, Indira Gandhi, Catherine Hepburn, and Michael Jackson. <laughs> she also interviewed First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. This one sticks in my mind because at that time I was serving as the First Lady's Chief of Staff and Assistant to President Clinton. We knew a Walters interview guaranteed a vast audience, and we also knew what to expect. Barbara Walters would be unsparingly candid, unflinching, probing, intelligent, informed, fully prepared, tough, and fair. It is my honor and a great delight to present a conversation with a giant of American journalism and one of the kindest people I know. David. Thank you. Maggie, thank you for that very kind introduction, generous introduction. We're thrilled that you're here and we're thrilled that Barbara Walters is here Maggie tonight. and I go back a long way. You do? Yeah. Do you want to say a little more about that? Do you want to tell them how we know each other? We, we, were, we worked together how many years ago? Um, just a few short years ago. Just a few short years ago. <laughs> seems, like, seems like yesterday. <laughs> a decade or so. No, we had uh, very good, good times together. As Maggie's introduction suggested, Barbara Walters has interviewed probably more statesmen and celebrities than anyone else in history, than anyone else in history. She once gave me in New York a copy, a list of the people, her interviews that her staff had compiled, and a single space ran into 27 pages. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. Tonight we thought we might take a bit of a stroll down memory lane, helping to understand her background, but very importantly, what she learned from leaders, their reflections on leaders that she has interviewed over the years. And we're going to do that through a series of br very brief film clips. We'll show a clip and then talk a little bit about that point in her life. And, the, the, and, and most of it will be serious. If we have time, we're going to also turn to Clint Eastwood uh, <laughs> and maybe even Saturday Night Live. Um, but we have, but let's, 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 let's do the serious part first. Uh, Barbara said to a class uh, this afternoon, the first thing in any interview should be, tell us about where you were born and where you grew up. In this case, very relevant to this audience. I guess I do. I always say, if, if I can, tell me about your childhood. Your childhood. Yeah. Your first 10 years. And my childhood was, I think, a little unusual. I wanted my father to be a dentist and to come home, you know, 6 o'clock at night. Instead, my father owned a nightclub very, and a series of them very glamorous nightclub uh, in New York and in Florida and, and in Boston called the Latin Quarter. Uh, it was sort of like the Folies Bergere. So th the point of that, David, is that I grew up knowing that celebrities had problems huh. and knowing that they were real people. And it helped me because I have never been in awe of a celebrity. Interesting. That's very, very interesting, especially about the problems now. But you did grow up in Brookline. 
I grew up in Brookline until I was about nine or 10. I went to the Lawrence School in Brookline. And then my father opened another Latin Quarter in Florida and we moved there. And then we opened, we, they, he opened another nightclub in New York, another Latin Quarter. So I moved to New York finally with my family when I was 15 and I consider myself a New Yorker. Although when I come back here, I practice my accent. I say aunt, and I'm going to go home and take a hot bath. <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, that, that must have been only in my club, and he was, he was, uh, he had very well-known, big reputation. Also must have had a lot of ups and downs. It did. Um, in his final years, he lost everything. Um, he was a gambler by nature. If he hadn't been, he wouldn't have opened the first Latin Quarter, which he did, he said, by taking the 20 cents in his pocket and giving it to the waiter and saying, now we, we start out like Did this. that put a lot of responsibility on you? It, it, it did. I also had a sister who, in those days, was called retarded. Today, she'd be called developmentally challenged. Um, she was three and a half years older. It was, I, when I wrote my autobiography, I thought I would call it sister, because she had more influence in my life than anyone. I didn't always love her. I felt guilty. She was a sweet and wonderful person, and I think that she gave me an understanding and a compassion that I would not have had without her. Yeah. So it was a, that's such an interesting combination of being around people celebrities who had problems, and then also learning empathy at an early age. That seems to have influenced your, your interview style, because you connect with people, but you're willing to talk about their issues in a very empathic way. Well, I'm fascinated. I think we all are, but we don't know how to find it out by what makes people tick. Right. And a lot of my interviews, even with heads of state, had to do with, tell me about your childhood. Who are you? What is it about you that made you this person you are today. Um, I was criticized for a long time for doing that. You know, it doesn't matter what they feel. What matters is what they do. And I think to know why someone does it, what happened in the childhood, especially with a man, the relationship with his father, mother in a different way, but with his father. I, I, I like to go beyond the, the surface question. Um, you know, why are you dropping bombs? Do you like dropping bombs? <laughs> How come you like dropping bombs? <laughs> but, but that also reflects a deeper curiosity. Yes. Which is really a driving force. If for you. you don't have curiosity, you shouldn't be in this business. And you should be able to, I, I've, I've said, you should, I do a lot of homework and I write my questions out and I write them out and I write them out and then I can take them and throw them all away. You should do your homework, you should know your subject and you should have First and foremost, curiosity. Right. You went on to Sarah Lawrence, graduated from Sarah Lawrence. At that time, that was regarded as, it, it has always been regarded as a school for daring women. Well, that's putting it kindly. <laughs> Tell us why. Well, Sarah Lawrence, when I went there, uh, was considered, well, uh, it was a school that didn't give and doesn't give grades. It gives long reports. Sometimes I wish they'd just given grades. You didn't have to tell me what I thought, what I felt, so forth. But it was a school that taught you how to think for yourself. Right. And most of all, to not be afraid to ask questions. When I was there, it was an all-girls school. Uh, since then, it's co-ed. I have said sometimes, because it's an unstructured course, so many of them, you, you have so many electives from the beginning. And I've said, and I, I regret it, so I'm going to clear it up now, that I didn't learn anything. I didn't learn specific subjects. I didn't take chemistry, I didn't take physics, I didn't take a language, I must have taken something. But it taught me how to think, it taught me how to think independently. It had wonderful uh, teachers. And most of all, and I say this to all of you, it taught me not afraid to do this. Sarah Lawrence was all women. Did that help fuel your passion? about the advancement of women, or was it your own no. experiences? What was no, it? No, I was not I was not a Gloria Stein. I'm as wonderful a person as Gloria is. Um, I, I felt that there, I, that there was not, that there was nothing I couldn't do. I didn't feel restricted. I didn't feel I had to get married, and most of the 
the girls in my class were getting married. But in, in those days, I, I, the feminist movement came later. And I remember writing a letter to the president then of NBC News saying, we should do something on this. And I got a note back that said, not enough interest. <laughs> yeah, it was just beginning. OK, so shortly after you come out of Sarah Lawrence, mm -hmm. you have a little advertising stand, but then you go to NBC. Yeah. And, in, and in, I want to show a clip, because at NBC, as a woman early on, you were really expected to do fluff. Yeah. Uh, fashion shows, and you know, I used to call it tea pouring. What'd you call it? Tea pouring, not tea party, tea pouring. Here's my tea pouring segment. <laughs> and they were called Today Girls. Today Girls. Yeah, I was the first one not to be called the Today Girl. I'm not sure it was entirely a compliment. <laughs> I liked it at the time. I was so sure but, of it. But when you broke in, you had, to, you had to go off and go to a... I was the first one who came from behind the scenes. I was oh. not a model. I was yeah. not an actress. I, I, I was a writer on the show. I wrote for Hugh Downs. I wrote for the other people. And then, little by little, I went off and did stories on my own. Right. And at that point, there was an actress who was the... Today girl, and she wasn't working out very well. And they had to let her go. And so they, they had to pay her, so they needed somebody who would work cheap. I'm very good at working cheap. Uh, I'm very good at not working cheap. Um, but they put me on for 13 weeks. Yeah. How and I, I yeah. stayed on for 13 years. Right. And that was back in the early 60s. So, but then you went and made this transition from fluff yeah. into more, much more serious journalism with the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And let's show, there's a brief clip, it's only about 30 seconds, so it'll be first, let's try these clips out now. Can we bring that first one up, please? I did a story on the Playboy Bunnies. I had a Playboy Bunny school. I had the whole outfit, the whole getup, which I might not be able to do today. Quickly <laughs> elevated to reporter at large, Barbara did a great job with the fluffy Today Show Girl pieces. I enjoyed seeing you as a bunny. Thank you. I did. When tragedy struck, Barbara was sent in as a hard news reporter. My first day live on the air, I can never forget. These are the honor guards who have been guarding the casket of President Kennedy. If I feel or uh, seem a bit choked up, it's because I have just left the last guard. That was the first time I think I was on the air. It was. First yeah. time on the air. Yeah. Wow. But was that really you? They put you in bunny school? For oh, that in well, I was doing... <laughs> I was a very serious person. <laughs> I, I went off and did reports. Yeah. And so that's how the audience knew me, because they saw me doing these special reports. And one of them was the day in the life of a Playboy bunny. I am now going to instruct you how to bend over so you don't spill the drink. Your coming here has not been in vain. <laughs> if you ever have to be a Playboy bunny, forgive me. Yeah. Yeah. Who else would do this I for you? <laughs> you do not do this, because if you do this, you know what happens, right? <laughs> this gets into the drink. You do it like this. Ah, okay, okay. You know what your Harvard tuition goes to now. <laughs> Am I going to regret doing this? Yes. No, no, no. That'll be a classic. It'll be a classic. Well, listen, the vice president was here last week. You never know what's going to happen You're next. Right. They, uh, <laughs> that was a, and he was terrific. He was just terrific. But the, the, when you went over to Serious News, it was still a struggle. Uh, it was because there were not women in the news yeah. at, at that time. And it's only in recent years as you know, David, where we've had women covering wars and women in combat and so on. And when I first went on the air, I had a, a partner who insisted that I not ask any of the serious questions. Um, his name was Frank McGee. He was a very good reporter. He was your co-anchor. He you was my co-anchor. Co I was forced on him. Um, he did not want me. 
Hey, Frank McGee, and what happened? Well, you worked on an arena. Um, I, have, I have said when I give advice to younger people, fight the big fights. And when this happened, and that I was not allowed to ask the serious question, I could only do the teeth-pouring questions. I went to the head of NBC News and said, I, I can't live with this. And the compromise was that he could ask three questions. And on the fourth question, I could then come in. The other compromise was that if I got the interview outside of the studio, then I could do it myself. And the first interview that I got outside of the studio was a man you may have heard of called Henry Kissinger. And it was so long ago that I had to explain who he was and what his accent was all about. <laughs> uh, one of your first big international breakthroughs, to skip forward, yeah. came with Fidel Castro. Yes. And it was hard to get that interview, but you eventually were invited to Cuba, and you wound up spending a lot of time. We did. I, that would not be possible today. I've tried to do uh, interviews with him ever since, up to this very moment. but. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. We were then the first Americans uh, to have crossed the Bay of Pigs since the invasion. You were the first, first American. You were with him. I was with him. Would we you spend 15 days? You could never do that today, but yes, I 15 did. days with him. Well, we, we traveled all through Cuba. We traveled all through the Sierra Mountains where I sat next to him while I held his gun and hard candy to give to the young kids who came by. I mean, it could never happen uh, yeah. today. But um, it, we also knew from that interview, which we had not been certain of before, that he was a communist. Yeah. Uh, because there was been, what was he? What really, how yeah. did he feel? And, and so on. Um, I liked him a lot because I'm a woman at that time, and obviously still today, there was this, <laughs> did we have a romance? Because how else could you? You know, what, what were you doing being a female reporter with Fidel Castro if you didn't have a romance? We did not have a romance. To my knowledge, he did not speak English. I learned years later that he did speak English, and he was deliberately not so he could hear what I said about him. <laughs> but in any event, we spent a good deal of time together. He is a, a magnetic uh, personality, and we went, all, we went all through Cuba. Yeah, let's look at that clip briefly. It was brief, uh, if there's a way we can bring these bring the lights down quickly so we can get through these, these, that would be great. I don't know how to speed the process up, Greg. On the ride across the Bay of Pigs in his armed patrol boat, we talked of the assassination of John Kennedy to see if Castro could shed some new light. Do you feel that it was done by Cubans who were afraid of a new relationship with the United States and Cuban, Cuban exiles? Actually, I couldn't affirm that. Honestly, I tell you, I could not. We would have to go deeper into the personality of Oswald. Who was Oswald? And for whom Oswald used to work? And I'm sure that the CIA should have enough information about that. We asked Castro if he thought that Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy knew of the CIA attempts on his life. Now, well, I'm going to give an answer. Fully sincere. It seems to me absolutely impossible that it could have been carried out this kind of plan for almost 10 years without the express or explicit authorization of the top authorities of the country. Did you come away convinced that Kennedy and his brother knew? No. You're not persuaded one way or the other? Do I think they knew? Yes. Am I 100% persuaded? No. I think it's possible that right. it was done by a, a, another layer uh, in the government. And did you come away after your time with Castro thinking that they, they might be involved with Oswald? No. And as a matter of fact, as you say it to me now, it wasn't something I thought a great deal about, although I should have. Um, but what I felt with Castro was that 
If we had allowed it, he would have been our friend. Tell me about that. If we'd had a different... If your view had a, had a different policy. I mean, I still don't know why we haven't recognized Cuba. It seems to me ridiculous. But um, I felt that if we'd had a different policy, that he wanted very much to be an ally and a friend. On the other hand, he probably not, would not have been in power anywhere near as long had he not had the opposition of the United States. That's interesting. And his power came you, was partly from his magnetism or... What he was, was else about He was the, extremely magnetic. Both men and women liked him. He also did very good things in the country. I mean, we, we know of political prisoners. We know how torturous it, it can be. But he also developed an education program for those people in, in Cuba. He developed a, a highly sophisticated medical program, which they've done films on and so forth. He raised the standard of living for most of them. But he was also, you know, there are very few, when I start to think of the great leaders, and I'm going to leave things out because this is spur of the moment, I think of Fidel Castro. I think of Anwar Sadat. I think of Margaret Thatcher. As leaders, as the as big leaders. As leaders, as charismatic, huge personalities. I can't think of a lot of others. An uh, Anwar Sadat, there's a photograph here when you had your famous uh, a set of interviews with with Begin and Anwar Sadat. There's there here's, this is uh, Barbara Walters with Sadat on the left and Begin in the center, 1977. Tell us a little bit about that trip and that famous. It's set the of only time they ever did a joint interview together. Uh, and, they, and they asked you to do it, didn't they? they? Uh, well, Begin did. Begin asked Sadat that Sadat was not going to do a joint interview, and Begin took him aside and said our friend Barbara, will you do a joint interview? And it was the only one um, that they did. Um, I've talked about Sadat, and I said this to you earlier today, David, because when people say to me, of everybody you've interviewed, who, you know, who is the, the, the most, this, I say Anwar Sadat, because he changed history by his courage, by his intentions, and it cost him his life eventually. Um, but he changed the course of history to this day. And so if I have to pick, though, I mean, Begin did his part, and you know, certainly Margaret Thatcher was a, a great leader in her time, but Sadat changed the course of history. And I don't see leaders like that in the world today. Mm -hmm. What was there about there? There was something about him that seemed, uh, 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 he seemed almost, a, Sadat seemed almost a transcendent figure. There was a quality That's about funny him. funny because I thought you were going to say saintly and I was going to say no, not saintly, but we're going for the same thing. He had vision. Yeah. He was broader than just how do I stay in power and what are the three or four things that I have to do. He had fought as a soldier. He had risked his life. Um, he also was married to a perfectly wonderful woman um, who who I still see to this day. You still see her today? Yeah, she lives in this country a great deal of the time. And you've often, in your interviews, thought about, okay, the spouse and what the relationship is and how that shapes the leader, and what did you see in her in that relationship with him? He adored her. He had been a soldier from a poor family. She came from a very good family, from an English uh, family. She had to fight her parents to marry him, this, this general who was also at that time considered black. I think he was from the Sudan. His family were not thrilled with this marriage. Um, and I thought that she was, a, the two of the wives who have stayed with me, both as friends, uh, one, one is, is uh, Mrs. Sadat, and, and the other would be um, Baradiba, uh, the wife of the Shah of Iran. Really? That's striking. Who's had a very difficult life, as so she one came can with understand. Him she came when he came out, and then was with him, and when he was in medical treatment. Yes, um, and then when he died, <coughs> almost no country wanted him when he was alive, and they didn't want him when he died. And Sadat had him buried in Egypt. Mm. 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 And did you interview the Shah as well? Yes, I interviewed the Shah, who I remember saying to him because he was accused of, of torturing prisoners. And I said, you do not allow free press. You do not allow us to investigate. And he said, noblesse oblige, you cannot insult a king. 
He also felt, and there are some leaders, few, but some, who feel that they were born to be king. Right. And he did. He had that. Yeah, the well, Shah felt he had been born to be king. Well, he had been, in effect. Well, he had been, but he yeah. felt that it was more than just being appointed, right. that this was his mission, that this was his destiny. Right. You began interviewing presidents with President Nixon, mm -hmm. and you've inter interviewed every president since then. Yes. Nixon several times. You, one of the memorable conversations with Nixon came after he left office uh, in, in 1980. By this time, he had already had the David Frost interviews, but he was also hawking a book, but you had a chance to talk to him. The Let's David look at the Frost interview, uh, David paid him. Oh, he did? Yes. Aha, uh -huh, that's why he got it. first. And sold it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, good luck. Uh, I You've never, you don't pay we're for We're not him. allowed to at ABC, at any of the network news. We do not pay for interviews. Right. That's interesting. I hadn't appreciated that uh, difference. Let's look at this uh, brief tape with uh, Barbara Walters and Richard Nixon, 1980. Tonight's interview with Barbara Walters is live and obviously unedited, and we'll cover... You write of our lack of will and uh, leadership, but this lack of will is directly traceable to Watergate and Vietnam, both under your administration. Now, Watergate will be debated, uh, Vietnam will be debated for many years to come. But Watergate, Mr. Nixon, was you. When you see how Americans today distrust their leaders, when you see cynicism instead of hope and instead of will, don't you feel responsible? Well, I certainly feel responsible for some of the developments that have occurred. Uh, for example, for what has happened to the CIA, which was an overreaction to Watergate. Okay, let's go closer. Afghanistan. The Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. What would you have done then, and what would you do now? They're in there. Well, first of all, 18 months before they invaded Afghanistan, they had a coup d'etat which gave them control of Afghanistan. They should have been stood up to then, and then we should have conditioned our further discussion of arms control, which they wanted, on that particular... Well, you keep talking about standing up to. Let's take it right now. How do we stand up to them now? How do we get them out of there now? Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? Yes, I think so. Whoa. I would like to have heard what he said about Afghanistan. Yeah, I know. I didn't see that clip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about two aspects of this. Tortured individual, Richard Nixon. <sighs> Frank Langella, the wonderful actor, played Richard Nixon in Frost Nixon. Mm -hmm. And wanted to meet me because he wanted to know what I thought of Nixon. And I don't know whether you will understand this, but I said he seemed to me constipated. <laughs> Everything was such a, an effort. And he wanted, he would, when we did an interview, he would start out telling dirty jokes to the camera crew. He wanted to be liked. He wanted to reach people. And he had no idea how to do that. He didn't in his private life. He didn't, in, as you see, in his, in his professional life. Um, I did several interviews with him, so I, I'm grateful for that. But he was a man who, who it was ultimately tragic and never found himself, as you, as you can see, even from that little bit. Right. I've never, I've seen him called and described in many ways. I've never heard him called constipated. Well, now you have. I know. <laughs> that is a whole new way to think about the Nixon, the Nixon legacy. I'm not sure we'll find it at the Nixon Library, but that'll be all right. Uh, I was really fascinated by that, but the way, the approach you took in that interview, we had it just, a, it went by very quickly, but how you waited. I asked for a time to. You asked for, tell us about that. You were interviewing him. You had him, you had him on live, right? We had him on live. Yeah. And that, that, he wanted to be on live, and that's right. very dangerous. He didn't want to be edited. He did not want to be edited. He, he, he turned 60 Minutes down because they wanted to edit him. He said, no, it has to be live. And I remember at one point in the middle of my interview, I wanted to turn to foreign policy questions, and I couldn't find my questions. And I nearly went crazy, I'm live, and I, and I realized I was sitting on them. <laughs> <laughs> but I had asked the stage manager, I said, give me a 30-second hard time cue, 30 seconds before the end of the show. I said, Mr. Nixon, did you burn the tapes? Did you say, did you, 
Did you, do, do you regret, or did you, did you burn the, did, what did you ask? I him? said, do you regret that you didn't, you, that you I didn't think burn the tapes. that you didn't burn the tapes. Yes. And he said, as yes. you heard, he said, yes. He said, yes. He, and uh, it's the first time he ever said that. Mm -hmm. But the point was that you, by, by restricting it, so he didn't have a chance to put all sorts of qualifiers That's in right. There. You had to have a yes now, or no. Had it been on tape, he would have said, well, when I think about it, but you have to understand, Barbara, that the, the mechanism didn't work, and oh, please, yes or no, you know. You got it. I got it. It was the risk. Well, sometimes you have to take it. Well, that's your dad. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, what reminds me of that when we were talking about the last question, because you and I have yeah. talked about this, was when I interviewed uh, Putin. Right. And I saved my question for the, ver for the very last question in case he walked out. And the question was, uh, you're not going to show this, are you? Or no. You? Okay. The question was, Mr. Putin, did you ever kill anybody? You asked him, did you ever kill anybody? Did you ever kill anybody? And I saved it for my last question in case he got out. And he gave, uh, he gave me, I thought, the strangest answer. He said, no, because that wasn't in my area. <laughs> but there's a, there's a song. Yes, well, I was talking to David about this earlier. There was a Tom Lehrer. Tom Lehrer, who went to Harvard, who wrote wonderful satirical songs, and one of them was about Werner von Braun. And he said, If the rockets go up, I don't care where they come down. That's not my department, said Werner von Braun. <laughs> so that's what I thought with Putin. No, I didn't kill anybody, not because I'm such a wonderful man, but it wasn't in, killings were not in my department. Maybe it was over here with Vladimir, but it wasn't mine. <laughs> a very different president that you went to see, I, and I think the year was 1981, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, you went to see him on his ranch. I did. Uh, he had, he, this was his escape. This, I, I, I said that it was the scroungiest uh, a Jeep I'd ever been on, <laughs> but this is where he went to escape. It wasn't a very glamorous ranch. It had a little lake. It had a robot on it that said true love, where he could take Nancy. Um, it, it had a very comfortable house with no books. No books. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting detail. I'd never heard that before. That's interesting. We have a little clip here, I think. And the president takes the wheel. I hope you're a good driver. You know what you're doing, I hope. <laughs> yes, I've been driving this for quite a while. Yeah, you probably deduced that it wasn't yeah. new. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but this is the scroungiest <laughs> Jeep. I have the upholstery is coming out. I mean, I know we have an austerity program, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> well, it's a 1963. And uh, the upholstery, oh. you'd be surprised that we've, we've finally given up. We've had it reupholstered a few times at quite some cost. But, you know, you, part, you, you stop at some place where you're doing work and the horses are out there. It's the horses that do this. They, they can't resist it. They... <laughs> the nicest man. The nicest man. Uh, the warmth that he exuded when, when he met anyone. Uh, I don't, whatever you think of his politics, he was a gentleman and a lovely person. Nancy. Um, I like Nancy a lot, and I say that protectively because not everybody does. Nancy um, got a bad reputation be in a way because she cared so much that she tried to protect her husband in, in every way uh, that she could. It was one of the great marriages. I saw her, uh, not this summer, but uh, the summer before in California. She still has Secret Service men. She's, her mind is just fine. Um, she's very frail. Um, and I, I, I think it's one of the beautiful love stories. He said that when he heard her footsteps, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get this right, and it's going to annoy me that I don't, but that when he heard her footsteps at the door, the whole room lit up. And you, your assessment of him as a leader? Well, what interests me now is how much we talk about Reagan. How we, you know, let, let, let Reagan be Reagan, and, and why don't we, you know, go back to Reagan? And I'm not certain what it is that we're talking about. Are we talking about his economy? Are we talking about his general attitude? I don't know. What do you think? 
Well, I think that I thought one of his two accomplishments was to uh, lift the country's spirits. We were very demoralized about leadership and about a country. And, and we went through the whole malaise thing with Jimmy Carter. And there, he made people smile again about the well, country. Well, but do you think that's what they talk about when they say that we want a leader to be like Reagan? That uh, oh, that I think that there, the conservatives have now embraced him as standing yeah, for the exactly. conservative movement. Yeah. And whatever else, you know, they say he was the successful conservative. He's the model, and because he went out with such goodwill yeah. on the country's part, then he must it must show that conservatism can be compassionate and be and be effective. Uh, but he's become he's been seized upon by so many. Yeah, he's, lost, he's venerated. Yeah, 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 and it's it's very hard at that point to know what Reaganism means when it's seized upon by by so many people. I do agree with you that he had a. Uh, he was a very kind-hearted man. He was, he, but he was more kind-hearted about individuals than he was about groups. I've often found he that was, the, you're right. You're, I've often found that liberals really care about groups, but sometimes with individuals they're not really terrific. And by the way, if the you sat next to him at a, at a dinner, what's that? If you sat next to him yeah. at a dinner, because I was fortunate enough to be at the White House once or twice, um, he told jokes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And he liked it. Mm -hmm. You know, George H.W. had lunch with him every week. The most important thing that he wanted to know from the staff, do you have any fresh jokes I can tell him? <laughs> I had, he had to go armed with fresh jokes for every Friday, Friday lunch. And it was a, uh, uh, but, but I, I, uh, I do think he, you know, if he met an African-American who was down and out, he would give him the shirt off his back. But he didn't see African-Americans as a group as being in trouble. And I think that was a real shortcoming. That you know, it's and you you've got to you've got to relate to more than the individual. You've got to understand the the, the the dynamics. I don't think that that was part. He just hadn't lived in that. I kind was going to say, if you know, his, and you do, you, if you know how he grew up, uh, and and how deprived in many ways his childhood was, it was not something. They were not groups of people he met. And he wouldn't have known how to right, treat. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, I think we're going to have a chance now to, to jump uh, up to the more to the present, and I think we have some clips with Barack Obama. Can we bring those up, uh, Barbara Walters and Barack Obama? You How did you them? feel when you read about the three heads of the auto companies taking private planes to Washington? Well, I thought maybe they're a little tone deaf to what's happening in uh -huh. America right now. Uh, and uh, this has been a chronic problem, not just for the auto industry. I mean, uh, when people are pulling down $100 million bonuses on Wall Street uh, and taking enormous risks with other people's money, that indicates a sense that you don't have any perspective on what's happening to ordinary Americans. Should bank executives, it's almost Christmas time, forego their bonuses? I think they should. Uh, that's an example of taking responsibility, I think. <laughs> this man who was considered such a great communicator, what did he do wrong? It's a tough time. I, uh, unemployment is high. Folks are hurting. I wouldn't want to take back any of the investments that we've made in education. Um, so I think from a policy perspective, he's done an outstanding job. She's a little biased. I, you know, what? It's a tad. You're lucky. I'm, I'm here watching him. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to uh, talk about Syria. Do you plan to recognize the opposition um, and give them some legitimacy? We've made a decision that the uh, Syrian opposition coalition is now inclusive enough, is reflective and representative enough of the Syrian population that we consider them the legitimate representative of the Syrian people uh, in opposition to the Assad regime. And uh, so we will provide them recognition. And obviously, with that recognition comes responsibilities uh, uh, on the part of that coalition. That's a big step. It is a big step. It never happened like that. I mean, he said, you know, when a certain mark comes and they cross that mark, uh, we will take action. Uh, and he hasn't. And I think this is perhaps one of the things that when people criticize him, uh, this is what's brought up, that he said he was going to do something about Syria and didn't and was sort of rescued by Putin. You, you, you have said that when he was elected, there was almost a sense that he was a messiah. Mm -hmm. And that that... Well, he has this great uh, these expectations yeah, from the sky. Uh, you know, he had this this great gift uh, of articulation. I mean, more than that, uh, he he spoke in almost in a spiritual way, and I think that the country also felt relieved in general 
that they could, uh, that we could elect an African American. I think even the people who didn't want to elect an African American had to feel that we had done something quite amazing and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what do you think has happened since? Well, the people I talk to talk, use the word very often, the disappointed. They're disappointed. And he also seems, I mean, this is a man very involved in his family and his children, as we know, perhaps more than any other president. Um, and there is also the feeling that he doesn't see enough people, that he doesn't listen to people. I have uh, friends and people in government who talk about they meet with him and he uh, listens to what they say and doesn't respond and doesn't take action, that he is this sort of solitary figure in the White House. Isn't that what, what you hear? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that and the fact is what well, Leon Panetta and Bob Gates have both yeah, written in their memoirs. Ju I just read the review today of yeah. the Leon Panetta book, and that's what he says. Yeah. I mean, don't you think it's extraordinary yeah. to have two such heavyweights? Saying as we can't Gates get inside, Panetta? we can't get to yeah, him, we yeah. can't get. And, and anyway, we don't know what he thinks. And while he's still in office. And while he's still in office. That's very unusual. People are usually much more circumspect. For a while. I don't Standards think that, you know. It, it, you know, to sit and, and give opinions is, is the easiest thing to do based on no facts. Um, I don't think he cares what people think. I think he cares enough to be reelected, and I think he cares enough about the issues he cares about. But I don't think he worries day by day about what people think. Well, in some ways, you can be worried about history and what's your legacy, your big legacy. He has said, you know, time will tell, we will see, so on. I've asked him that question, you know, how do you want to be remembered? I don't get anywhere. Is he enigmatic to you? I love interviewing the two of them together. Huh. I, I enjoy it. Because? He's, he's funny, she, and she's funnier, and they're a charming couple. Uh, so that they're, they're it's, 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 I like to, to see the way they treat each other. Um, they are so different. I remember once, it was before Thanksgiving, and I said, what are you going to do for Thanksgiving, and so on. And he went into this very florid peace on earth and blah, 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 so on and so on. And she said, eat the pie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't find him enigmatic. I think he is, an, I, I find his whole history so interesting. And you know, you and I talk about the fact that I say, tell me about your childhood. This is a man who had to spend his childhood pleasing people. I mean, first a father he didn't see, then a stepfather who, was not really there for him, then a mother who abandoned him to, a, to a, a grandparents. He spent all of his early years trying to be accepted and liked. And I think we have to recognize the mark that it made on him today. Mm -hmm. That makes you more sympathetic. I don't, when I, I try very hard when I'm doing an interview to not to think about whether I like them or don't like but them. But you try to understand them. I try to understand them. And not be judgmental. And not be judgmental. Mm. Did we, I shut we, you up totally? No. <laughs> I was thinking we were going to shift gears. Okay. And do something very lighthearted. Because uh, we, all of us are wanting to hear about Clint Eastwood. And that famous relationship, let's, let's bring up the, Oh, I have to talk up, about this. This is so sad. <laughs> Are you afraid of okay, showing emotions? I don't think so. Do you ever tell anyone? No, not necessarily. Not even a woman you're close to? You must drive people crazy. A woman would go absolutely nuts if you knew 100% about How a person. How do you know? Religion. It might be terrific. It, was, it might be boring. There'd be nothing else to know. The women I know understand. You don't see them again, right? <laughs> yeah, somebody who's that interested, I wonder why they're that interested. Why aren't they enjoying the fact that, that there's more to know all the time? Hmm. Don't you think? Don't I think? Well, I don't know. I think somewhere between the two. I mean, would I think you, it's nice you, to you be If you knew 100%, there's what's there to know. You there's would drive me know. nuts, and I would drive you crazy, because I would be saying, but, you know, but didn't you, or haven't you, or haven't you? Well, we could try it and see if it worked out. <laughs> we'll start with this interview. <laughs> if this is okay, we get somewhere. Well, maybe we'll do another interview. Yeah. 
<laughs> I think we'll stop and reload. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now I have to tell you the saddest story. So you see how that ended, and I said, stop tape, right? When the interview was over, he was then the mayor of Carmel, and he asked if I wanted to come back and have dinner with him. <laughs> and I, being a reporter, said, no, I never combine work with pleasant, I, uh, please. So he went back to Carmel, and I went on to my life. And ever since, I have thought, I could have been Mrs. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> There's more. So last spring, I think it was, the Jersey Boys opened in New York. Oh, and by the way, he then married a, a reporter who came to interview with him, and, <laughs> and, and they got divorced. So here was my chance. So they were showing the Jersey Boys a couple of months ago, and the woman who was in charge of it um, I said to her, Peggy, make sure that wherever it is, I get to sit next to Clint Eastwood because it could still happen. And maybe he remembers it as I do. So the movie came on and there was a dinner after and I sat next to him and so forth. And she said to me later, well, what was it like? And I said, he was pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that sad? That is very sad. That's very sad. But that's, I think that's the most flirtatious interview in I think years it's the most flirtatious interview I've ever done, yes. Yeah, yeah. you almost had to stop the interview, didn't you? I did stop the interview. I said, let's <laughs> stop tape. I mean, ah. <laughs> well, who knows what can happen, right? I mean, I may come back next year and be Mrs. Clint Eastwood. Who knows? But don't hold your breath. <laughs> Uh, I want to <laughs> <laughs> um, can we actually, can we go to Hillary Clinton for a moment? Because we, we should not leave here without seeing you. You've interviewed her several times. Yes. Mrs. Clinton, instead of your new book being the issue, you have become the issue. How did you get in this mess where your whole credibility <laughs> is being questioned? Oh, I ask myself that every day, Barbara, because it's very um, surprising and uh, confusing to me. But Does your husband want you to run? He is very respectful. He knows that this is... He does want you to run. Well, he, he wants me to do what I think is right. If you ran and you became president, what would they call your husband? First spouse? <laughs> I think it's important that we have a female president. I do. I do think it's important. I, I don't know the exact timing of it or who that might be. You know, if, if I look at my friends and former colleagues who are now in the Senate, it was the women senators on both sides of the aisle who finally broke the fever over the government shutdown and the debt limit debate. They have been working across party lines, and we need more of that. I listen to you and I think you gotta run. Something, you gotta <laughs> run. This is the way I talk. I, I wanna start by, by saying I can't believe this day has come and I can't believe it's for real. Right, because <laughs> I, I, I don't know what we're all gonna do uh, without seeing you going one place or another, asking questions we'd all like to ask. Uh, the I, as long as you're here, let me ask you a question. Oh, really? Yes, yes. <laughs> I want to ask is how you're going to run, but... Well, I am running around the park. <laughs> <laughs> that was last spring, I guess, wasn't it? Yeah. You were just... That, that was your final that appearance on The View. my yeah. final day on The View, and um, Secretary Clinton came on to well, as, wish as, me well. As Maggie Williams said earlier, you've all, you all have had a really interesting, positive relationship. Yes, we have. And, and what kind of leader do you think she'd make as president? I think she would make a very good leader as president. I think that she, uh, most people seem to feel that she's absolutely going to run. Uh, I wouldn't bet 100% because it's so tough to run. It's, she's gone through so much. I don't know what where she is in her head. I mean, she may just feel it's enough already. I've proven myself. I have a child. Um, I have a marriage that somehow or other, 
has gone on, and I have seen them privately. <laughs> no, I mean that. I mean that. I have seen them privately. We sometimes spend Christmas with the same people, and I think she's crazy about him. Um, and so I can't say that she would absolutely run. She may take a different, a different course. I don't know how you get so close to the triumph and walk away from it. Do you think? But a, it's possible. Do you think a a, a woman would think about it differently than a man would at her stage in life? Yes, I do. In what sense? I will I've, be I've heard people tell me that. that. I wonder about um, because I think that for most men, and women too, if I look at myself, the most important thing in, in their life is their work. And I think, and I'm generalizing, and I hate myself for doing this, but I think that women, other things come into it. Family, um, how you feel, how is this going to feel in five years? I think it's more complicated for a woman than it is for a man. Hmm. So that she, that so I, I would think that she would run, but if I had to bet the store on it, I'm not sure I would. Hmm. Interesting. And, and, and do you think their relationship has changed and he, you know, people used to make jokes about him and what he'd be like as first spouse. But while she was Secretary of State, he was extremely yeah. supportive. He has always consistent. said that, that she is the smartest person that he mm -hmm. knows. Mm -hmm. I think he's very proud of her, and, and I think he wants her to run, or at least he certainly has, has said that. I, wouldn't that be interesting to see him I in the White House, to see them both in the White House? Um, and, and we don't know. I, that's one of the, I, I guess, David, I mean, you know more about this than I, having been in government for so many years. I guess she has to make a decision by January. I think so. And she owes it to other people who may want to run. Yeah. And as you look at the Bush family, do you worry about they're, they're, they're in one clan versus another and these are dynasties? What I think about with the Bush family is something we talked about earlier, and that is when you hear about Jeb Bush, what you hear about is that there are some emotional problems in the family. With, with, his, with his spouse. Yes. She may not want him to run. She's, she no, doesn't like the spotlight very much. Uh, but uh, you know when I talked to you earlier and I said, you know, what, what a person is in their private life uh, plays a part, and it shouldn't, but it does. I don't know what the complexities are in that family. Um, it's something that's brought up so often that I think there may be reasons there that he would not want to run. I'm not suggesting it. I don't know him. I'm, I'm, you know, if this were a court You of have law, not interviewed him? No. No. You have not interviewed Jeff. I have not interviewed You've him. You've interviewed the father several times. Yes, you? I'm very fond of his father. So. Hmm. And, and the son, W? <laughs> oh, that son. I know we were <laughs> talking about Jeff. A, a, a very affable uh, man and, uh, and, and will go down in history as a pretty good president. He, he had, he certainly... Better yeah, than it people thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, he certainly made his huge mistakes, but I think that history will regard him kindly. It's hmm. hmm. interesting. Uh, I think we should go to the floor uh, for a short while. I have one more clip to show before it's all over. But there are microphones here, and uh, as, as uh, please identify yourself. There are microphones upstairs. I wanted to, uh, please, come ahead. Uh, please. Here. Um, my name is Brad. I'm a junior at the college, and you've been kind enough to share uh, with us tonight and, and with, with us over the past few months and few years about some of your uh, most favorite interviews that you've uh, conducted. And I was wondering if you might be willing to tell us about your least favorite interview. <laughs> my least favorite interview, I have written about this, so I don't mind saying it. My least favorite interview was with Warren Beatty who, if you say to him, what time is it, says, that's, that's a very hard <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed him once when he was making a movie and asked him that, and he went on so long, I went to commercial. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are people who want to do interviews and who have things they want to say and there are other people who are being pushed by the studio to do an interview, and I can name you some of them. And it's, oh, you know, it's, it's but it, part of what our job is, 
is to open them up and to find a way to get through. And, and that's when I go back again, do your homework. I remember doing an interview once, and the, the person I was interviewing said, you know more about me than I know about myself. And that's true. And by the time I have done the homework and read and looked at the clips, looked at the television, I'm just saying this to any of you who are doing interviews, don't just read the material, get the television. What's their body language? How do they look? How are they acting? I know them pretty well. Now, what was your question? Who's the hottest interview? Warren Beatty. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you for coming, Barbara. My name is Mansoor. I'm a first year here at the Harvard Business School. Um, my question is, uh, has there ever been an interview that you've turned down because um, you know, you've, you've questioned the person's morals or their beliefs? Or have there ever been you know, ones where you have said, um, because of the things that they have done, I, as a reporter, cannot you know, condone this or this would you know, cast a bad light on myself or ABC News or NBC or whoever? Has there ever been a situation that's come up, and, and how have you dealt with those? Uh, I've done the interview. Oh. I mean, I've done more murderers than presidents um, and stayed in touch with some of them, as a matter of fact. Um, and I'm very unjudgmental. Not in, in my day-to-day -day life, I make judgments about friends. But when I do interviews, when I do... Um, I remember after interviewing uh, Yasser Arafat and after interviewing um, Sadat and Begin and so forth, doing an interview with Katharine Hepburn, who said, I see things in black and white. I, this is right or that's wrong. And I said, well, I don't. Sometimes I see things in shades of gray. And she said, well, I pity you. So and the answer to your question is that it's, there are very few interviews uh, uh, that I would turn down. I don't want to do something for the, just for the sake of sensationalism. That I will turn down, and that's, we see more and more of that today. But as I said, I've, I've interviewed, you know, John Lennon's murderer, the Menendez brothers. Uh, I mean, I can go through a list of, 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 I remember what the Menendez brothers, Eric Menendez said, I'm, I'm, I'm just a normal boy. And I said, Eric, you're just a normal boy who killed your mother and father. Please. Good evening, Ms. Walters. My name is Mabra Aga, and I am a 2L at Harvard Law School. Thank you so much for being here. Thank My you. question is related to interviewing, but more so about storytelling. Um, some people, and I think rightly so, have identified you as the best storyteller of all time, and it's clear that you've heard some of the greatest stories and maybe some that you think could use some improvement in terms of the um, the method of storytelling. So my question for you is, for those of us who are searching to tell our own stories, whether that's through a job interview, through an admissions essay, through even giving a speech, what practical skills and attributes do you think are required to be a great storyteller? Uh, well, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with making good speech. I, I think you should try to think what the most important things there are if you want, do them in categories. You can do it chronologically, whether you're talking about childhood, middle years, college, and so on. And what is it you most want to say? You, you know, just because you want to write your story doesn't mean that I have to read your story. So what is it, of, why should I care? Figure out why I should care, and then write your story. Why should, they, why should this person? Yeah, why, not story, why, why should, should you. You're writing the story, okay? I'm gonna read your story, right? Why should I care about you? And how do you make that address the question of how do, why should I care? I think you have to find out in yourself what are the most important things that you have to say. What, are, what is it you most want the world or one person to know? And then what is the most dramatic part of it? And I, and it's very, I mean, I'm pausing because it's very hard to say to someone, sit down and write a book and you'll be a bestseller. But I mean, do you really have something to say? If so, what is it? And then go ahead and do it, try. I mean, more books have come out where you never expected that, that they would make it. And then there are other books which should have the, the biggest sale and they're not, they're boring. So do you have a story to tell? Start with that. Do I have a story to tell? If so, what is it? 
that's awfully simplistic, but I don't know how else to, to answer it. Thank you. Mm. That usually goes to your passion, too. What is it you, uh, what do you care deeply about? I'm not sure everyone has a passion. You don't think no. so? No. I know that they say when you're in college and you don't know what you want to do, you should follow your passion. I had no passion. <laughs> And I could have made it a successful person if I'd had a passion. <laughs> Please. Good evening. My name is Auden Lawrence, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, and I'm wondering what advice you would give to young women who are interested in um, being involved in or entering the journalism world um, and thinking about keeping your credibility and breaking through. What advice would you give? I ask this all the time, and I pretty much say the same thing. Um, get your foot in the door. Get there before everybody gets there in the morning. Stay later than everybody stays. Get the coffee if they want the coffee. Learn your subject. Don't be above it. Oh, I'm, I'm a graduate student. Why should I get her a cup of coffee? I'm not saying you should, but you're not above it. Why should I have to go out and, and get the, the paper, or the, the iPad? You know, do it. Get, get your foot in the door. And then just be so invaluable that they give you a raise and your own desk and your own place, and, and you can fire everybody who wasn't nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> that part of it. Not very is much. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds very old fashioned, but you still think that's what works. I do. I think get it. If you want to be in, 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 in broadcasting, and not everybody is going to be on camera. Everybody wants to be on camera. Get your foot in the door. Go to your local station. Go to your cable station. It's too hard to begin in the network. Learn. Do your homework. You're not just going to start here. Make yourself so invaluable. Make yourself so valuable. And fight the big fights. Don't bitch and complain. This is wrong. She got it. I didn't. Just do the job. But do the, when you say fight the big fights, it was like when you were starting out and you had this guy yes. who wanted to ask all the questions yes. and you had to work it out. Yeah. You, you took that fight on him. There, you, and there are times when it's so important that you'll have to take the chance of, 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 of walking out, of leaving. Um, and you've got to be prepared to do and that. And you have to be prepared. And every little thing isn't, isn't worth fighting over. You won't remember it in 10 days. Please. Hi, so my name is Hannah Masalma and I'm a freshman at the college. And so I was wondering what you have to think about interviewing people in a language that you don't speak because they say speak to a man in a language that he understands and you speak to his head. Speak to a man in, in the language that he loves and you speak to his heart. So are there, what is it like to interview someone in a language you don't understand? It's What's very you pick hard. Out? It's very hard. And what we are able to do now, which we couldn't do before, was simultaneous translation. And we used to put the translator, let's say, to the to my right. And so everybody, the, the, the person doing the talking would keep doing this and the translator would become the subject. What we do now, and I haven't done this for a while, but we, we were an earpiece and we put the translator in a different room so that the person you're interviewing is looking at you and not looking at the translator. Very hard to do, especially if you're doing it live because you still have to wait for it it to happen. You know how boring uh, some of those press conferences are. But we, you know, we are global now. We're all uh, everywhere doing interviews and, and uh, uh, simultaneous translation seems to work good. Do you have the same translator for both of you? No. You, the person you're interviewing has his right. or her translator and you have an ABC yes. translator. Yes. Your own person. Because yes. you trust if them. If you can, yes. Yeah. You've yeah. had experience and they, you know that they're going to get it right. Uh, yes. And I have heard, I've done interviews in which there's a translator, and then the person himself says, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> it turns out he's, he or she speaks better English. It's very tough to do interviews with translators, and get because the nuance is so easily lost. And it must be harder to, the eye connection and all of that. It's well, tricky because why you've got I something in your That's ear. why I don't put the translator here. Yeah. That's why I have the interpreter behind me with the door closed, so that I'm hearing it but I'm looking at you, otherwise I'm looking here. Right, please. Hi Barbara, uh, I'm a sophomore at the college, my name is Tasneem. 
And I wanted to know, uh, oh, sorry. Um, is there anybody that you would wish you'd interviewed that you'd never gotten the chance to? Yes, or any there is. There's, there's, uh, people ask me that all the time. Uh, I would like to interview the Pope. No Pope has ever done, uh, almost never done a, a, a printed interview, and certainly not a television. That would be an enormous occasion to interview the Pope. I would like to interview the Queen, Queen Elizabeth. She's never done an interview. And just when you think, I've done it, I've interviewed everybody, something else happens, and there's some big piece of news that catapults you. Uh, but there are a certain number of people whom we uh, all want to interview. And of course, every day when you pick up the headline, that's, that's the day that we're all running out to get that person. Yeah, please. How's it going, Barbara? Uh, my name is Jamarcus, and I uh, thank you for coming to speak today. Uh, one thing that I was wondering, so when you spoke to Bill O'Reilly in May, you didn't give uh, much merit to the possibility of there being a war on women in the U.S. And uh, there being what? Uh, a war on women in a the United States. Women. A war on women? Was I talking to Bill O'Reilly about a Bill O'Reilly is always at a war. I love Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> right, right. Well, I didn't know that he had a war on women. Oh, no, you were talking about... Uh, the equity that exists within society for men and women. And you were saying that at this point that a woman can do almost anything uh, that a man could do within society. But one thing that I was wondering is that when you, when you look at the rulings that came out within Texas recently where all but eight abortion clinics have been shut down or when you look at a report that was published by Hannah Bowles in the New Yorker that found that women in the workplace who speak about their salaries are viewed in more negatively than their, their male counterparts. Um, I'm wondering in the same way that a Michael Jordan, who's rich and famous, can't really understand the struggles I face on a day-to-day -day basis as a black male. Do you think it's possible that the fame that you have now can make it difficult to properly uh, understand the implicit political and social struggles that women, uh, everyday women face on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm a little confused. Do I think it's possible for me to understand what yeah. a woman goes through on a day-to-day -day basis? The fact that people perceive you not only just as a woman, but as a famous person, so they had this admiration of you, do you think it can make it difficult to see I would you? like to tell you the number of people who do not adore me. Yeah. <laughs> it is a very long list. And I think one of the things that happens when you work for a news department is they keep you relatively sane. Uh, you know, we don't have press agents, we don't have a lot of people fawning over us. Obviously, my life is privileged, and, and I'm very grateful for that, and especially that I can do things like this, that I can talk to you and, and learn from you. But um, it's not always going to be like this, and there is a downside to being well-known to, you know, don't cry for me. My life is pretty wonderful. But, you know, nobody, nobody has it all. You do have a concern about where television is going, That's television news is going, yeah. and how it covers people who are hurting in this country. And well, that's a, there are two parts. I have a concern, and David and I are talking about it earlier, about television news, which I think is uh, uh, everything has to be fun. Everything has to be light. Everything has to be fun, or everything has to be an opinion. We don't just want to watch the news, which is why CNN is struggling, because they don't know what they should be. It used to be just give me the news, now I don't want to just the news, I need your opinions. And especially young people like yourself, you're not getting your news from television, you're getting your news from your telephone, you're getting your news from your iPad. So it's a very different time and there's a big effort to be fun. Everything should be fun and I deplore that. I, I used an example earlier, I said that you know you do a half hour news and the last 30 seconds is the marriage of two whales. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, uh, that part of me, uh, that part of it is bothering me. And, and I worry about, about news in general. The, the 6.30 or 7 o'clock, I don't know what time you get your network news here. It, 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 they're still important, we still watch them, but those of us who do are dinosaurs. It's a different, it's a different time, and people want opinions. And the important thing, I think, is to be able to get more than one opinion. If you're only watching Fox, if you're only watching MSNBC, you're doing yourself a disservice. Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. And I, okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank yes, you. you did. And I greatly appreciate the authenticity in your answers as well. 
<laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hey, we have time for one last question, please. Hi, thank you for being with us today, Ms. Walters. Um, my question, ref oh, sorry. My name is Carolina and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, my question refers to your earlier statement where you said that um, you don't see leaders like Castro, Sadat, and Thatcher anymore. And I was wondering what kind of qualities you saw in those leaders that you don't see in leaders that you've interviewed recently. That's a very and good question. I think, I think the ability to make decisions to have vision, to believe in what you're talking about, to have passion, um, not to do something just because you want to get reelected, um, a commitment to something that's bigger than yourself, that's important. I, I don't see the, maybe those leaders are around and they're young and, and I just haven't seen them, but I don't, I mean, what comes to my mind, and then I will regret it later, because why didn't I think of it? But we were talking about Angela Merkel, who comes yeah. uh, closer to it, I, yeah, I, I yeah. think. In, in Germany. In Germany, uh, in, in uh, being a, 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 a giant. She's not quite a giant, but I don't, I don't see right now the giant. But she's the strongest leader But she's Europe. the strongest. Do you see giants? No. No, I don't. I, I, uh, the Pope has emerged as a, as a much mm -hmm. more influential figure than one might have assumed initially. I think people look up to him mm -hmm. as they do few other leaders in the world today. I don't see many that, I think if you look at a variety of measures of public confidence in institutions and leadership, they, their people are not finding it in political leadership, particularly not even business leadership. They sometimes in some countries find it in military leadership, but they don't find the big statesman figures who are I mean, there was even a sense when, when the big, big figures like uh, Churchill and De Gaulle and, and, and uh, FDR and Eisenhower left the stage, yeah. we went down a notch, but now there's, we've seemed to come down another notch in, in people's estimation. We don't, it's not just that we don't have heroes, we don't even have villains. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, we have a few villains. Well, we do. We had Saddam Hussein. Yeah, yeah, we took yeah. care of that, but yeah. yeah. So I, um, I, 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 Barbara also has such a, a wide range of capacities. I, I thought it might be fun to close. Uh, when she went on to Saturday Night Live for years, had, had parodied her, and uh, there's a clip here when she went recently on to Saturday Night Live to parody herself. <laughs> What an honor it was to see my groundbreaking career in journalism reduced to a cartoon character with a ridiculous voice. Oh. So, Barbara, you're stepping down after over 50 years as a TV journalist. I mean, do you have any tips on how to achieve that kind of success? Okay. okay. Do not be afraid to ask the tough questions. Like, if you were a tree, what kind of a tree would you be? <laughs> uh, your place or mine, Brokaw. <laughs> but the real money is in making them cry. <laughs> Nothing brings in the viewers like seeing a celebrity reduced to tears. You may think, oh, I'm really feeling bad for them, but all I'm thinking is ka-ching. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Wolf, thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.